The next speaker, I'm sure I saw him noting down a few things, would have a lot to answer because it looks like all questions are directed at our police service. He's the director general of the Ghana uh, Police Service Public Affairs Directorate. He's in charge of policy formulation on the relationship between the police and media and in charge of police communications across uh, the country. He holds a master's degree in communication studies from the University of Ghana, Lagon, and a master's degree in peacekeeping and security from the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. He has over 20 years experience in the Ghana Police Service, and he has immense international exposure, including going on missions abroad. He is currently spearheading a host of reforms. And when it comes to where he attended school, from KGB Senior High School to Mawuli to GIG, all of them. He said I should mention all of them. <laughs> the old boys will be happy too. Let me welcome ACP David Senanuoklu to the podium. A round of applause. Thank you very much. And um, I want to thank Media General for giving us this platform to discuss pertinent issues that concerns national security. And when I say national security, it is about our own security. Those of us working in the security agencies and those, of our, those who are outside the security agencies constitute what? National security because we all work towards serving the national interest. When I had this invitation on WhatsApp, that was on Thursday that I should, I was someone to come to Media General for this uh, function. I was a bit worried because I thought that, well, maybe this might be a trap <laughs> to invite me here and put me on the carpet because normally when we talk about state security, because of the central role the police play, all eyes are on the police. And let me state that my presentation here is on the Ghana Police Service. I do not speak for other state security agencies under the National uh, Intelligence Act. Fortunately, I have learned a lot from my very senior colleagues here who have had very wide experience in media and, of course, security issues. So I will only build on what they have already stated. In fact, we have, for several decades that I have worked in the Ghana Police Service, the relation between the police and the media is some kind of love-hate relations. Sometimes it's sweet, sometimes it's bitter. But that is how things work, because sometimes conflicts can also be a very good antidote to solving issues. As I said, there have been several moments of challenges that the police and the media face. And of course, of late, if you have been following social media trends, police officers have also complained about the way they are being represented in the media, about the way the media reports on police and police officers as people who have the authority or wear the state, the badge of the state. So the space is opening. Police officers are also expressing their sentiments. And then the media is also expressing sentiments about policing. So to me, I think that is a healthy debate. Because if we look at the communication cycle, if the media is always Turning information without feedback from those of us who are receiving it, then the, the cycle is not complete. So police officers are also expressing their concerns about the way the media reports on policing, crime, and security. Recently, there was a video that went viral about a driver and his mate who assaulted a police officer. The case is in court now. I think the last court 
the last sitting was last week or so. Now, just within that week, a radio station assembled about five executives of Transport Union. They went on air, abused the police, told the, told the public through that radio station that Umu police in Nibia or Bibia for carbon. They broke egg in the studio to curse the police. And we, if we give space to this kind of expression, is that freedom of expression? I leave that for all of us to ponder on. In fact, the role of the police and the media are not divergent, but complementary. If you look at the duties of the police, which is to protect life and property, to prevent crime, and to maintain law and order. And the duties of the media is to inform. You see that at the end of the day, the media is informing the public to serve a certain interest. It's sending that information so that people can make wise decisions on their safety. People can understand what the police do, why we do certain things, and what the police stand for. So if you have these areas of interest, it means that the police should not, under any circumstance, be an enemy to the media, nor the media should be an enemy to the police. Now, if you talk about press freedom, I look at it in two ways. We identify the media as a tool that we can use to promote policing. So I can use the radio, I can use TV, print media to promote good policing. Now, the other area of contention is about the practitioners, the journalists who operate within the media space. And that is where some of the conflicts arise. In fact, I have done some analysis about concerns about security officers being the number one attackers of journalists. But when you look at all these reports, you realize that it is not something that is authorized by the police authorities, but it's because of misunderstandings between procedures, especially when it comes to the media reporting on police operations. Does a journalist understand protocols when it comes to demonstrations, public order management? Does a journalist even understand the ranking system or the command structure of the police? So when some of these incidents occur, and frictions occur, it doesn't mean that this is an organized, sanctioned state uh, activity to repress freedom of the media. But it, they arise because there are confusions, there are misunderstandings between the protocols regarding policing and, of course, the way the media operates. Protection of life and property, let me state, is not the responsibility of the Ghana police alone. But journalists can also contribute meaningfully to protection of life and property. In fact, you, I think Madam and others will agree that when we had the criminal libel law, the police enforced the law because we are charged to enforce the laws as duly enacted by citizens of this country. No, now, we don't have any business enforcing the criminal libel law because there's no law. And we cannot enact a law 
and enforced by ourselves. We enforce laws that are enacted, agreed on by all of us here in this country. There are a few provisions in the Criminal Offenses Act which talk about publication of false news, publication of news that would evoke fear and panic. But for now, we apply that law with caution because there are views about it. As to whether, for example, the, the example that I gave about the radio station, how do we enforce that law? Arrest and becomes headline. Police descend on this radio station. But this is a clear example of a radio station being used to attack law enforcement agencies and, of course, would cause public disorder. In fact, there are several questions that I would want to put here. Freedom of the press. Does it give the license to journalists to publish anything under the sun? And I believe if you listen to my previous speakers, they have alluded to this. Do journalists have the freedom to publish without cross-checking facts? Because apart from the gun that can kill, false news can also kill. False news can also cause people to lose their jobs. False news can break families. False news can jeopardize the security of individuals. If a journalist commits a crime, does he enjoy any immunity? If a journalist is a victim of a crime, are there any established protocols? In March, the Daily Graphic front page said that there have been 40 attacks on journalists by military and police since 2006, but there was no prosecution. 40 journalists have been victims of attacks by police and the military, but no prosecution. So I asked my officer there to go to Graphic and list the cases so that we can follow up and find out what happened. We have identified four regions where such attacks were reported as per the version of Daily Graphic, Volta region, Greater Accra, and then Eastern region. We sent a message to all the police stations to find out whether those cases have been reported. No reports. So how do we prosecute without a report? Let me state here that journalists, like any other person in this country, is entitled to the protection under the law. So that if the police are unable to prevent a crime and you become a victim, there's a redress through the criminal process. And the first step in every criminal process is a complaint at the police station. The complaint cannot be solved by a press conference. The complaint cannot be solved by radio discussion. The complaint is the victim or the witness or the relation to take the step to go to the police station and say A, B, C, and let it be documented. And I know that journalists and police officers are very good at keeping records, documenting, so that if I go back to this publication and I find that the report was made at police station A, because the police records are always there and no action is taken, then I can say that the police are ignoring complaints from journalists. But if there are no reports, how do we act on them? 
Attacks on journalists and any other person is criminal and let's report it and let's follow up. Because the police are also held accountable by the media. And let me state that the change processes that we are undertaking within the police service are to a very large extent influenced by some of the media reports that we receive. Some of the criticisms that are coming out through the media and they are informing us in the way we are reforming the Ghana Police Service to give you the service that is in line with our democratic dispensation. So the media is a very important tool. But let us all understand and work along certain protocols. Now, we have taken certain pragmatic steps. I've said it somewhere, and I want to outline those steps. When we had the infamous Latif incident at the CID headquarters last year, I've had to behold every radio station every morning to answer questions. And I realized that we were not making any headway because there were fundamental problems. Protocols, if you are reporting on a demonstration, a spontaneous demonstration, what do you have to follow? What do the police also have to do to identify who a journalist is? So I approached the Media Foundation for West Africa, unfortunately they are here, and said, look, we cannot continue talking at each other. We need to find a way of talking with, uh, with, with each other to find solutions. So we have developed a framework. Fortunately, about three weeks ago, the police administration has approved this framework that we hope would form the basis for identifying some of these challenges between the police and the media. And one key thing is to set up a public complaints desk at all regional police headquarters. And this framework was developed in close coordination with the GJA, the NMC, Primpark, and GIBA, with the Media Foundation providing the support. That framework is ready now. So that if we are talking about police media relation, we can have a document that we can rely on. The second aspect of the framework is to ensure that we introduce communication skills and media relations in all our police training schools. If the police is trained to understand the role of the media, you don't need anybody in authority to tell you how to do your work. If the police is trained to understand the way the media operate, and he meets a journalist, he knows what the journalist stands for. And if the journalist is also trained to understand police procedures, it might not completely eliminate some of these conflicts, but it will reduce them, and then we can have a forum or platform where they can be addressed so that we can improve on our work. Because the police and the media cannot always be at loggerheads. We need to unite for the national interest. I've just whispered to the GGA president that we are even organizing a workshop to engage selected media houses on reporting on crime, police, and security. Crime news, if you do a content analysis of almost of our newspapers and even online and even broadcast, crime news stops, apart from politics, I don't know which other news, because crime affects the very quality of our life. So we need to report it professionally. And doing that means that we must have specialized decks in the various media houses. We don't have to treat crime news as a general reporting. If you finish GIG, your first assignment is to go to the police station as the station commander, what crimes have been committed, and you report. But beyond just reporting, there's a need to train journalists in analyzing crime trends, looking at new security threats. Terrorism, environment is a major security threat. And it, it affects the quality of our life because we are also part of the society. So we are looking at all these areas to open the space so that we can have professional decks 
crime specialized decks in all, almost all the major, major media houses so that we can improve on police media relation. Let me emphasize, let me emphasize that enforcing the laws as are stated in the Criminal Offenses Act and any other act should not be misconstrued as repressing press freedom. But the challenge to us in the law enforcement agency is to how transparent we are, how we explain our actions, and where, how we are able to build relations between the police and the media. And if we are able to achieve this, I don't think that if journalist A commits an offense and is invited to the police station, a radio producer will not go on air and say that, ah, the police for bar, and on my AC, on my AC. But he will say that, yes, there is a report about journalist A, and as per the procedures, he has to go and give his side of his story to the police. I believe that if we are able to work this way and we are able to explain what we do, why we do certain things, it will help reduce these attacks or this perception of using state machinery, especially the police, to repress press freedom. Because police officers have also benefited from a free press. Police officers have also suffered silently. But the press has also picked up their issues and they have been redressed. There are people who cannot pay to organize a press conference. But a journalist can offer his space, his pen, or his airtime for the poor person to also have his views heard. And it's all in yours to democracy because policing cannot thrive in a repressive environment. Policing can only thrive in a free democratic environment. And that is where the point of convergence is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to ACP David Clue.